It's about having a growth mindset, being comfortable getting uncomfortable, pushing yourself to new levels, new potentials, exploring what is possible within you. people have the perspective of how much technology has changed the world like you do. Over the past three decades, you've worked with extraordinary leaders at companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, to name a few. Your journey is so fascinating. What originally drew you to the tech industry? I always believed that there was a connection between business and the arts, and I didn't see any of that happening in the world of computing as I knew it. When it came time to look for a job, computers were the last thing that I would have ever been looking for. And so when I sent out hundreds of resumes, I didn't expect something that happened one morning. I was thumbing through my stack of rejection letters, and I froze. And in the corner of one of these envelopes, there was a rainbow apple. Any company that would use that as their logo understands this connection between art and business, art and humanity. And I said, oh, I hope this isn't a rejection letter. And I tore it open, and it was. Oh, no. <laughs> but back in the day, rejection letters had people's phone numbers. And I called that number, and I said, I think you've made a mistake. <laughs> Working with such visionary people like Steve Jobs, what did you learn from him that had the most profound impact on you? There was one very specific thing that, that really changed my life, and that was on the first day that I was setting up in my new office. One of those inner office envelopes came across me, and it said something that I'll never forget. It said, how is the decision you're making right now helping us to ship the greatest personal computer the world has ever known? It was the first call to mindfulness that I'd ever experienced, but it's really saying your time matters and every choice you make in it matters, and that your impact will be the summation of tiny step after tiny step after tiny step, and those steps will be shaped by your intention. So how is the decision you're making right now affecting not only our ability to ship this incredible product, but how do those tiny steps actually shape the story of your life? The 80s was, of course, this revolutionary period of time for personal computing. What were some of your early observations of how people interacted with this new technology? I didn't know back then that the Macintosh was going to be what it turned out to be. And there was this incredible feeling of a groundswell of something changing. We watched these changes that made technology better and better, but our interaction with this technology was in sessions. We would sit down and we'd file off a letter, you know, then we'd turn the computer off and we'd go out and live our lives. The biggest change I've seen is the always-onness of technology now. It is something that's always with us. And when we see people who are feeling senses of tech addiction or anxiety, we're seeing the price we pay for that always-onness. You now have a new book out called The Happiness Hack. With all of this incredible knowledge, in the book you talk about the power of mastering our minds so that we can master our habits. And focus, as you say, is a big part of that. So how do we reclaim our focus to make sure that we make time for the things that matter most? There are three very important things we can do, and they all focus around taking a break from tech. There's a great phrase in neuroscience, and it goes like this, your brain will do more of whatever it's doing right now. So if what you're doing right now is this, your brain will say, ah, this is what it takes for her to survive. When we wake up in the morning, usually the first thing we do is press that stop on our alarm. And the second thing we do is see what happened overnight that we might have yes. missed. Put that thing down and go do something else. The most important thing is really set an intention for that day that is independent from your tech. The second is to take a break from tech at night, and I think at least 20 minutes is a great time. And then use those last 20 minutes to bring thoughts up of the things that matter to you, the things that feel important. While we're sleeping, the brain nurtures and kind of tends to the actions we've prioritized during the day, but then very gently sort of starts to sweep away the things that aren't on the main path. So if we call to our attention the things that really matter to us before we sleep at night, the brain will nurture those as important thoughts. So the third thing is kind of an expansion of those, and that is find time 
at least once a week where you can go into an extended session with no technology. Take three hours to do what Cal Newport calls deep work and drop into what he calls a monk mode morning, which is something that's really focused on what matters most to you. So the three things would be do something other than tech when you wake up, do something other than tech and set your intentions for the next day as you fall asleep and treat yourself to such a wonderful thing, which is a three hour session without tech, one morning a week. What is the one thing you hope happens as a result of this book being out into the world? You know, I hope people learn how powerful they are and that they are in charge of their life. I hope it really gives them both the clarity and the conviction that they can hack back and they can reclaim more of what they want in their life and who they want themselves to be. Mm -hmm.